So uh, thank you for coming. And title of the presentation today is Feeding the World by Boosting Crop Health. And it's a little bit of a general uh, topic, not for a specialized audience. So um, hopefully that, that's good for everyone. organized here so before I forget and not not leaving this for the end I'd like to acknowledge a few uh, organizations first the Ontario genomics for their financial support the natural science and engineering engineering uh, research council and CERC for the discovery program grant and the accelerator program grant that I do have from them and the Canada Foundation for innovation or CFI for the equipment that they provide uh, to my lab and to the university in general. And other thank you, um, apologies and thanks for uh, photographers who have put some of these uh, royalty-free pictures on the web, which I am using tonight. And I apologize for those that are not well credited. Uh, it's important, uh, but uh, sometimes it's hard to find who took the actual picture or make the, the work of art. And special thank for the, to the uh, Royal Canadian Institute for the uh, opportunity and the invitation. <clears throat> so uh, my presentation will be divided in three parts. Part one, uh, a brief history and hopefully some fun facts about crop protection. And in part two, uh, why we still need crop protection today and the importance of it and maybe a little uh, known fact about uh, crop protection. And in part three, and really uh, where my interest as a scientist lies, is in um, discovering uh, new, um, new chemicals for crop protection with new modes of action. So moving away from the traditional uh, pesticides or fungicides, which I will talk a little bit about uh, tonight. And we're using a pharmaceutical approach, a very similar approach to what is used to develop drugs for, for human health. So history of crop protection. So the domestication of plants, or as we know it, agriculture, uh, started back uh, roughly around 11,500 BCE. And this is a bit debated with some uh, uh, rye growing in, in uh, what today is called Syria. And it was uh, just on the, what was then called Phoenicia on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And it's debated whether the rye growing there was intentionally, intentionally planted there, or if it just grew there naturally. But uh, for sure, by uh, 9000 BCE, uh, there was wheat growing uh, in the, uh, what we call the Fertile Crescent in the, what we call today the, the, the Middle East. And so wheat was dom domesticated. And here's a nice picture of a, a wheat field, not from 9000 uh, BC, but from today. And these wheat fields would, would have looked quite different uh, back then. Here we see uh, a mechanized uh, harvester harvesting the, the wheat. And you can see also the, the nice rows uh, of wheat being planted. And, and back then it would have been more, uh, more scattered um, and not as well organized and probably not as vast as today's fields. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, about a uh, 10,000 years after uh, domestication of plants, we had our first books on, on agriculture and how to manage plants. And this came from, from the Greeks. Uh, one philosopher in particular, Theophrastus, uh, which has been coined the father of botany. And he wrote two important books. One was Inquiry, Inquiry into Plants and on the Cause of Plants. And he described in these books, uh, plant germinating, so how plants are actually made. And uh, he also talked about where to grow certain crops and, and crop rotation and so on. Um, about 100, 200 years later, still in the, uh, the BC, the, uh, before the Common Era, um, a, um, a Roman scholar named Varro uh, described for the first time the use of a herbicide and this uh, herbicide is called Amorca. And essentially, it's a byproduct of uh, olive oil production. So you can uh, understand that it didn't happen in, in the northern uh, part of the continent, but around uh, the Mediterranean. And this is a modern um, 
way of making olive oil, you would have upstream a press, and the, uh, the greenish material is your olive oil, and the brownish uh, water uh, are the, the um, what are called the lees or the sludge coming out of the, the olives, and this is the amorca. And essentially, uh, the use, it was used for, for many things, but one of them, in, in the sense of herbicide, was used to, um, to treat uh, field before the farmer would, and kill, kill weeds and so on before a farmer would go on and, uh, and plant his own crop. Today, these, uh, these um, amorca uh, are collected in, in tailing ponds. They're dried, made into pellets, and used as combustible. And uh, a thousand years later, roughly, we are at the pinnacle of uh, weed uh, control. And I'm going to cite a quote in the next slide from a, a book called the Geoponica. The Geoponica was a multi-authored book. And uh, essentially, it was all the knowledge uh, that people had on agriculture. And some was quite rational, and some were uh, quite fantastic. And um, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the control of dodder. Dodder was known as lion weeds and lion's weed. And we don't, probably don't see it in, in great detail here, but it's the, the yellow or golden mass in the middle of this crop. And uh, on a nice picture, you see it. It really looks like a lion's mane. And a close-up view of it uh, shows you that it essentially strangles and tangles the, the, the host plant. It also makes, it's a parasitic plant, and it also makes a contact uh, with the vasculature, so the, the veins equivalent of, of the plant, and uh, draw the nutrient away from the plant. So it's an important um, thing to control for the farmer. And the fantastic quote coming for the control of daughter. So let a marriageable virgin, barefooted, nude, without clothes, her hair down, and with a cock in her arm, a cock is a rooster, go in circles around the affected spot, and immediately the daughter, the lion's weed, would let go and the legumes would be reinforced, maybe because the daughter fears of the cock. So, <laughs> quite interesting. Um, and here I, I got a nice uh, work of art from an American uh, artist, uh, Jorge Mascarenas, that describe um, some a conflict between uh, the French-speaking uh, well, in Wallonia and the, uh, the Dutch-speaking in, in Flanders, in Belgium. And of course, I took this picture out of context to show the, um, the cock uh, attacking the, uh, the lion's weed. And um, it was more difficult to find a picture for a marriageable virgin. But um, having suffered in, in high school during the 80s, I thought maybe of uh, this iconic person. <laughs> so uh, this is Madonna. And she uh, is a very famous, very iconic uh, artist and very controversial as well. And so is the control of, of daughter using this method. Unlike the, the control of daughter presented in the Geoponica, uh, Madonna was quite successful as an artist. And uh, this weed control, not so much. So today, um, how do we control daughter? Um, we use non-host plant, and I'll talk about it a little bit more um, later in, in the presentation. Um, selection of resistant varieties or cultivars. And if the farmer is um, um, hit with a, a, a major infestation of daughter, uh, the farmer uh, may have to resort to uh, burning uh, his field and, of course, killing both the parasite but also the host, so no crop for that year. And uh, one way of, of getting rid of daughter is to uh, treat with herbicide. These are called pre-emergence herbicide where uh, you have to treat before the, the actual plant are coming out. Um, so Geoponica, about uh, 10th century, now we're uh, 19th century, about 900,000 years later, and we got a little bit more serious. Uh, in 1863, a uh, German scientist called Heinrich Anton de Berry, which has been coined the father of modern uh, mycology, which is the study of fungus and mushroom and so on, 
it determined that pathogens and specifically fungi were the cause and not the result of plant disease. So it was thought before that that fuzzy white stuff that was coming out of plant when they were sick was actually produced by the plant in, in itself as a result of the sickness. And he demonstrated that uh, if you take that little fuzzy white stuff and put it on an, uh, a healthy plant, that plant would then become diseased. So he showed for the first time that the, um, the white stuff or the fungi was the causal agent of the, the disease and not a result of it. And that changes the way you can approach the problem. So before the berries time, uh, the word disease was really an umbrella term and it was used for describing wounding. Sometimes it would be a hailstorm, for example, damaging the crop and the crop would then said to be diseased. Or if the crop would grow on a, um, on a soil that is, doesn't have enough nutrients, maybe the, the leaf turn uh, yellow, and that would be also cause disease. And of course, pathogens, which were not known at the time, would also cause disease. In um, <clears throat> about a few, uh, few decades later, Pierre-Marie Alexis Miardet developed the first foliar fungicide, so fungicide that you apply on, on leaf of plant. It was called, the, and still called, the Bordeaux mixture. And it was designed to protect grapevines from downy mildew, so another fungus infecting a grape. And that's where serendipity came in. It was actually not designed to, to protect against downy mildew, but it was designed to protect from this particular pest. This guy here. So apparently in France, they had some students and on their way to school, they would snatch some, some grapes uh, from the grapevine. And some farmers uh, used a Bordeaux mixture on, on the grapevine rows adjacent to the street. And that would give an awful taste to these grapes and it would protect them from, from passerbys. And, uh, but Miardet's his great discovery is that he noticed that these vines that were treated uh, with the Bordeaux mixture were actually resistant uh, against fungals uh, causing uh, downy mildew. That was his big discovery. And again, serendipity in science is quite, quite important. What's in the Bordeaux mixture? Um, it's a mixture of a copper sulfate, so a, a metallic uh, compound, and calcium hydroxide mixed in water to make a slurry. And it's approved for um, organic uh, agriculture. It's still in use for that context today. But there's still a problem with that chemical. It's still, uh, it's a metal, and if you apply it to a field, it still accumulates in the ground. So you don't really get rid of it. And if it leaches in water and so on, it can affect, affect fish and so on. So it's harmful to fish, livestock, earthworms. You may not care about earthworms, but if you're an organic farmer, these are the, the little bees that will help the aeration of the soil. And just to show you that copper is, is still can be toxic as an element, we need it in some small dose, but too much of it is, is also dangerous. And the United Fruit uh, Company, which is now called Chiquita Brands International, uh, started using the mixture in the 1920s it, uh, on banana plantation. And the mixture was called parakeet because it would turn the worker uh, completely blue. And of course, uh, that's not so good. So a lot of them became ill and some even died from that. So just to show you that even organic uh, compounds used for organic agriculture are not, you cannot use them without impu with impunity. Um, there is always, always risk and these are the things you have to manage. And um, this is uh, grapevine leaves and the blue spots that you see are actually the copper sulfate. So first uh, wrap up for this section, crop protection, uh, real or fantastic, uh, has been a concern for humans since the beginning of agriculture. Humans have noticed that if you have weed in the field, your yield is not as good. If you have insects and they eat your crop, not good. If you have small animals, eating the crop, not good. If you have neighboring tribe stealing your stuff, not good as well. So 
they were concerned with visible things, so, um, and not so much with pathogens, which they did not really know existed. So before the 19th century, crop protection was mainly preventive. So uh, the idea was that you grow crop in an appropriate area, and uh, so with good practices um, and a lot of luck. Apologies. So part, part two, why do we need uh, still crop protection today? The main reason that people will cite, and that, that is the main reason actually, is yield. So you want to maximize your yield in the field, and that means uh, you want to maximize the, the mass of your product per um, surface area, per cultivated surface area. And yield security, which uh, kind of derives from this, is um, whether or not you have enough food to, um, to sustain your population. So, and it ties really into uh, yield. And the one I want to talk about today that we often ignore is the safety of the food. So if I grow something, uh, will that kill me? Will that make me sick? Is it safe to eat? And um, it is re a, a good reason for crop protection, but maybe a, a more minor one, more uh, a reason that is not uh, disclosed or talked about as much. So um, a few uh, sensational uh, things about uh, safety and, and crop, uh, crop protection. There's a disease called erg ergotism, and it's also referred to as St. Anthony's fire. And this is, uh, I guess, a woman afflicted of this particular disease. You can see her hands are turning black, hence the, 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 uh, they look burned, and hence the St. Anthony's fire. But actually, uh, the reason for these hands being black are the um, long-term ingestion of uh, certain toxins, certain chemicals produced by, by fungus called mycotoxin. And the uh, fungus uh, in uh, the, the culprit in this case is called Claviceps purpurea. And it produces about 40 of those chemicals that are uh, fairly harmful. And uh, the, this particular fungus affects uh, mainly rye, but other cereals such as wheat as well. And here you can see a head of, of rye, and these uh, black or purplish uh, structures are actually fungal-derived. Uh, and they contain the, um, the uh, they're called ergot uh, from the French, that means spur, because they look like spur on, on, the, um, on the head of rye. And these are the one that contains the toxin. And here is a, um, a bowl, I guess, of, of rye grains, and these black little grains here are essentially fungal structures. There are two, uh, two forms of, of uh, ergotism. One is called gangrenous. And essentially uh, what happens is that some of these chemicals are, are vasoconstrictor. So they, they prevent the, the proper blood flow to the extremities, so the feet, the, the fingers, the hands. And um, if that woman uh, continues to ingest uh, contaminated rye bread, for example, uh, the end result would be her hands falling off. And that has happened in history. And this woman, you can see it's a color picture. It's not a drawing from millennia ago. It does happen uh, still today uh, in, in other countries um, less fortunate than ours. There's another form called a convulsive form. And essentially, it will be uh, some other cocktail of, of alkaloids present in, in the fungus uh, will cause some muscular spasm and some hallucination. And um, this has been a history-making uh, plant disease, and uh, the convulsive form is of ergotism has thought to be responsible for bewitchment. And one great example um, it was the Salem witch trial of the 1692. Uh, so Salem is just across the border in Massachusetts today. And so a number of uh, women have been uh, determined to be witches and probably because of strange behavior due to the ingestion of, of improper food, and they were actually hanged. 
is there a silver lining uh, for this particular disease? And maybe there is. Um, the uh, ergotamine is the chemical that actually causes this vasoconstriction, so the, the gangrenous form of ergotism. But in the proper hand, in, in, uh, in the pure form, and in an appropriate dosage, um, this compound or a derivative of it, which is produced by Valiant Pharmaceutical, uh, called migranol, is actually a chemical that, um, that uh, prevents uh, uh, the start of migraines. So that, that is quite uh, interesting. And this uh, particular chemical structure would have been quite difficult to develop as a drug uh, just due to its complexity without really having the, the atrocious effect of the, the, the ergotism itself. Um, another thing that has been made from uh, ergotamine, if you look at the black uh, area here, uh, you can see the uh, same chemical structure. So some German scientist, now I can't remember his name now, has made a powerful hallucinogen from ergotamine, and it's called LSD. And maybe without LSD, uh, we would not have had um, great art or maybe Dark Side of the Moon from Pink Floyd. Um, LSD is uh, used on and off as a medication as well, uh, but it's, it's more off than on, and it looks like it affects the brain, so people are, are studying it and has been used as an antipsychotic drug uh, at some point, and military use as well for brain control, uh, but this is all in the past. Some other mycotoxins that do exist um, that are of concern, uh, one of them is the aflatoxins. They are produced uh, by Aspergillus flevis and Asper Aspergillus parasiticus. You often hear about them recurring, it's a recurring thing that you should not eat peanut butter because it causes cancer. And the reason you hear this in, in the news uh, is because uh, peanut butter does contain these aflatoxins. And it's quite unavoidable to have these mycotoxins. So what the FDA does, what the Canada, Canadian Food Inspection Agency does is that they, they do uh, sampling and they set uh, maximum uh, values uh, for these chemicals. So if your peanut butter uh, exceeds these values, then it's not on the market, period. And acute poisoning can lead to death, and apparently there were some uh, 120 deaths in, in Kenya in 2003 due to um, ingestion of contaminated food. And um, non-lethal but continuing dose of, of aflatoxin is apparently responsible for some liver cancers. Fumonisin is another one. It's produced by a species of the genus uh, Physiarium. It affects uh, corn and, and wheat. And in human embryo, it uh, apparently affects the uh, neural tube development. And there was a so-called outbreak of neural tube uh, defect and in Texas uh, in the 90s. Um, it's um, toxic for the kidney, toxic for the liver, and it, it is apparently one of the cause of uh, cancer of the esophagus. Ocratoxin is another one that has nothing to do with uh, okras, uh, but from the species where it's uh, taken or produced, uh, Aspergillus ochraceus and other species, penicillium, for example, may produce these. Um, so stop drinking beer and wine. Uh, you find these, uh, these uh, potentially you can find these toxin in beer and wine. Again, nothing to worry about. These are controlled. Uh, dried fruit, um, particularly uh, raisins, and it can find its way if a contaminated feed is, is fed to, um, to animals such as pigs, and some, for some reason pig is more susceptible to that. Um, they can um, accumulate the, the toxin within their organs and, and, and muscle, which is the meat that, that we eat. And again, can be um, nephrotoxic, so toxic for the, um, the kidneys. And in some cases, it has been known to lead to spontaneous abortion. So wrap up this section. Um, yield is really the reason for crop protection. 
um, and uh, from this uh, food security, having enough food to feed your population. And again, uh, food safety gave you a few examples um, that hopefully will, will stick with you. Um, is my food free of mycotoxins? So that's important. Um, and again, mycotoxin can accumulate in, in, the, uh, in parts of animals, including the, the milk, for example. Um, so it's something to monitor and to keep in mind. So uh, next, the third part, which I'm um, really more concerned with in, in my own lab, is to uh, s develop chemicals again for crop protection. And I want to talk of, uh, about a few concepts here. Um, so general concept, pathogens are essentially all these microbes, things that we typically don't see. That do, um, that do affect the, uh, the health of the plants. And I want to brush on the concept of host and non-host in this particular slide. And the example that I will use, the example of a pathogen that I will use is called Phytophthora infestans. And it's, it's a fungal, fungus-like uh, organism. It's also produced white fuzzy stuff. And, uh, but it's classified as an oomycete, not as a fungus per se, but it does behave like a fungus. And to illustrate the fungus, I'm going to use this uh, image here. It's a cold glass of Guinness. And the reason I'm using the, the Guinness uh, to illustrate that is because Guinness, Guinness is a, an Irish beer. You can see the little uh, leaf here. And uh, the Phytophthora infestans is really the, the pathogen that led to the, um, the great famine in, in Ireland in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, 1845 to, to 1860. And that has led to a uh, wave of famine and then a wave of immigration. So, um, and I'll use the beer analogy in, in some of the other slides as well. So, um, as I just mentioned, Phytophthora is capable of infecting uh, and devastating a field of potato plants. And therefore, potato is said to be a host for Phytophthora. So Phytophthora can grow on it, can ultimately kill it. On the other hand, wheat uh, is not affected by Phytophthora infestans, and this plant would be referred to as a non-host. So this, I'll use this in the in the subsequent slide as being a plant that is susceptible, and this is a plant that is resistant to the pathogen. In continuing with the beer analogy, um, I want to introduce the concept of race in a pathogen. And uh, to my surprise, Guinness makes a blonde beer, which I haven't had the, the chance to try. So these are two Guinness beer. So, they are part of the, the species we would call Guinness. And that means their genetic makeup is very, very similar. But there are some slight differences between uh, these two uh, individual beer. So one, of course, is black, one is blonde. They might have different tastes and so on. So that means that they have little uh, changes in their genetic makeup that make them uh, slightly different. And it's really what's happening with the pathogen. It's not a, um, a single entity, but um, it harbors races. So uh, little variation between individuals. So I'm going to call the blonde beer the race one, and the uh, traditional Guinness the race number two. Now, um, cultivars, what are cultivars? So you recognize those as being potatoes but you can see that they are uh, slightly different from one another. So they are one species, but they are, you can call them races if you like, we call them cultivars or varieties. So Kennebec is one with white flesh, white skin, Désiré, popular in Europe, uh, yellowish flesh, red skin, uh, and the more familiar one, the Yukon Gold, which you might see in the supermarket, 
yellow uh, flesh, uh, whitish skin. So again, these are one species, they're potatoes, but they have slight differences that you can see here as visual differences, but also other differences. So what's interesting is that, and these are just uh, artificial example just to show concepts, okay. Um, race one of our Phytophthora is capable of growing on Kennebec and making Kennebec uh, sick and devastating that particular field. However, race two of Phytophthora is not able to uh, infect Kennebec. Okay. So you have differences uh, within races in, their, in terms of their capacity or their virulence, as we say, their capacity to infect. Now, if we look at Yukon Gold, this one, as opposed to Kennebec, may be resistant to uh, race one, but may be susceptible to race two. So race two grows on, on, um, on the Yukon Gold, but does not grow uh, on Kennebec, for example. And you can see that the farmer could adopt a strategy where instead of growing Kennebec for, for decades, uh, in which case you would have a buildup or multiplication of individuals in the race one, a better approach would be to, uh, if you're a potato grower, to grow Kennebec one year and maybe switch to Yukon Gold the next year. And that way you can at least um, the, fu the fungal or the pathogen is always playing catch up in your field. So that could be a strategy to use. And of course, the Desiree cultivar in reality is susceptible to pretty much every race of Phytophthora and is uh, still in demand, I guess, because it is tasty, but uh, not your best cultivar to use in the field. Uh, in the next slide, I want to focus more on, on this aspect here and why Kennebec may be susceptible to one pathogen or one race of a pathogen and not the other. So again, we see our two races, race one, race two. Race one can infect Kennebec, race two uh, cannot infect, Kennebec is, is resistant. So instead of seeing these as, as plants, uh, let's look at the cellular level, what's happening. So uh, let's assume that this is a potato cell. This is another potato cell on another plant. And cells have at their surface um, proteins that are called receptors. And these receptors are really specialized in uh, interacting or in detecting very specific molecules. And one of the differences between race one and race two is the production of certain uh, molecules by the fungus. I will illustrate those. Uh, they're called typically virulence factors. Uh, it's not so important here. So race one produces that um, yellow rectangle and race two produces that black triangle. And you can see in the case of race one with Kennebec that the receptor here is not adapted to interact with the, the yellow square. And therefore that cell, potato cell here, being unable to interact with the, the molecule derived from race one uh, fungus, doesn't see the fungus. It's completely blind to the fungus. It does not know its existence. So that fungus or that race can invade that particular cell organism and, and uh, cause an infection. On the other hand, race two uh, is very well uh, detected by the receptor at the surface of the Kennebec cell. And therefore, the cell is capable of recognizing uh, race two as being a pathogen and will mount some kind of um, defense response or will build up some immunity uh, against it. And the way it works is that you have inside that cell, upon detection of the, the, the fungal molecule by the receptor, you'll have a buildup of a small molecule called salicylic acid, which I'll show the structure in the next slide. And that salicylic acid interacts with a protein that, that we call NPR1. 
and together they form a complex and this complex is what lead through uh, several steps to plant immunity or to disease resistance as we call it. Now, what's interesting is if you look at this system here, race one, Kennebec, if you treat the Kennebec or you spray the Kennebec with a solution of salicylic acid, what will happen is that you will have a buildup, salicylic acid will make its way inside the cell. So you have an, an artificial buildup of salicylic acid inside the cell. It's going to be recruited by this recept internal receptor or protein called NPR1. It will form a complex and you'll go from susceptibility to resistance. So that looks quite great. It works fantastic in the lab, but is it applicable to a field? Not so much, unfortunately. And there are a couple of reasons why spraying a field with salicylic acid does not work uh, so well. So first I want to look at the, the structure of salicylic acid. Uh, it's a simple uh, phenolic uh, compound. You may know one of its cousin, artificial or synthetic relative called acetyl salicylic acid, which is the, um, the uh, aspirin uh, that we use for, for headaches or, or fever. Um, Salicylic acid, um, its problem, uh, why we cannot really spray a, a, a field with it, it's a, it, it is short-lived in the plant. So as soon as it builds up, it is recruited by, by other system and it's uh, chemically modified by the plant. So there are some examples here, uh, some uh, glucose group are, are added, some sugars are added different position on the salicylic acid, or uh, you have the methyl salicylate, which you may know as wintergreen oil, um, nice, pleasant scent, or it can be modified by certain amino acids, for example. And these molecules uh, do exist in plant naturally, but they don't participate in the defense response or in immunity. So essentially, once you have a buildup of salicylic acid, it is taken away into other system for other purposes. So it doesn't linger very well, uh, very long for, to develop a long-term uh, immunity in the plant. So just uh, another slide to, um, to show um, why, again, conceptually it, it doesn't work well in the field and what we're trying to do to circumvent uh, some of the, uh, the shortcomings. So this represents uh, time, and if you spray a plant with salicylic at time zero, for example, the compound will be active and can confer resistance for a certain window of time, which you can call the window of effectiveness. And then, of course, what we do in the lab is we treat with a pathogen that can infect that plant in that uh, window time frame. So we see the plant being resistant. So now if you go to the field, um, you can spray plants with salicylic acid. You have a similar window of efficacy. But what happens with pathogen is they don't fall on the plant just right after your treatment or a little bit before your treatment. They can fall on the plant a day, two days, five days later, depending on the weather and so on. So yes, if the pathogen falls in this window, you would have some resistance. But outside, you will not have resistance. You have a big window of susceptibility. And so that is probably, and this is because salicylic acid is being metabolized and, and turned into other molecules fairly quickly. So what if we could design or, or find a chemical that I call X here that essentially works like salicylic acid through this NPR1 molecule to boost the plant immunity? but would have a longer window of efficacy. So effectively uh, reducing that time when plants would be susceptible and make, make it potentially more commercially viable instead of using a system like this one and having to treat you know, maybe every second day. It's not good for the farmer's bottom line. 
And you have to think the farmers are still business people. They feed people, but they also have to make a living. So it's also important that they do make money and so on. Um, so how do you obtain that molecule X? And it's through what we call an assay development. So what, we, what I've presented so far, what we know is that this protein, NPR1, can interact with the small molecule, salicylic acid. Together they form a complex, and in a plant it results into um, uh, resistance to, to disease. But in a test tube, uh, if you like, you would want to measure the formation of this complex. And this is where the assay comes into, um, into play. Essentially, you're trying to develop a system to monitor this interaction. And I, this interaction, I uh, exemplify it by a, a, a green circle, green light, like on the, uh, on the street and so on. And what is the assay? There's a collection of them. There are probably 10 times more assays than, than people sitting in this room today. Um, so this, uh, therein lies the problem of, of developing this system. Other controls that we would do, for example, to test the system would be to have the, this protein in PR1 without any chemicals, no complex forming, and then we don't have any uh, measurable output. And producing a good assay is essentially producing a good difference between a no output and the maximum output. And there again lies the difficulty of developing uh, these particular assays. Once you have a good assay, it works well. You test um, some chemicals. I show two here. One would be chemical Z. It does not interact with this protein and PR1, does not form a complex, no detection. And then you have your chemical X, which I talked about before. It interacts with NPR1, and then uh, it produces a measurable output. In the, the jargon, we call this a hit. And you need many of these hits to consider developing a commercial product at the end. So this is a first step, developing such assays. And then you have to miniaturize these assays. Typically, uh, you do this in what are called 96, uh, 96 well plate format. Um, and essentially, they're uh, little plates that contain 96 wells. And um, in, any, every, uh, um, in every well, you would put your protein and PR1 and a different chemical in each of these different wells. And here would be a positive control that you, you know should give an output and probably a negative control somewhere. And once in a while, you will get a chemical that interacts with NPR1 and gives an output. <clears throat> so I want to uh, briefly uh, and finish with that, the pipeline that we use in, in the lab and uh, it's really poached on from the, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and I want to show you a bit some timeline and, and the number of chemicals that are involved in, in this particular process. And just for the sake of, of showing uh, that we work very hard or we're very lazy, I don't know. But from the discovery of NPR1 to the fact that we figured out that it's a receptor for salicylic acid, it took about 15 years. So again, I don't know if it's because we're lazy or it's just difficult. Uh, but um, scientists or research works on, on a fairly lengthy scale and patience is, is certainly, uh, and serendipity is certainly quite important in the process. Now we are in this uh, second phase with uh, some assays being developed. And this is, uh, again, numbers that come from the pharmaceutical industry. And I've shown you in the previous slide that we can get hit or hits from a chemical screen. And it takes, um, um, for the pharmaceutical industry, so to design one drug, or on average to get one drug on the market, it takes uh, 24 of these, 24 to 25 on average of these hits. 
And um, the frequency of these hits is about 0.05%. Uh, so you need a minimum of a screening, a minimum of 50,000 chemicals to, to get uh, potentially, if you're lucky, one product on the market. And this is, is really on the low side. Typically, people will screen uh, tens of thousands, if not millions of chemicals. Um, and that's why uh, often you try to develop robotics to, to handle all of that. And so once you have your hit, um, you go, these are chemical structures, and then you go and modify these particular chemical structures, and then you rescreen these new structures you just created. And you'll get new hits, and these are called lead structures. And the number decreases uh, every time as you go through the pipeline. Once you have these leads, you go on and modify them again and create some new structure around your leads. And this is called lead optim, and you rescreen. These are called lead optimization. And these can be screened with the same assay, but typically you start moving into alternate assays as well. After that, and it's something I do not do uh, in my lab, I'm, I work in a lab, not in a field, so uh, once we need to go to, uh, to test these chemicals in, in, in the real world, we start with greenhouses, uh, so you can infect plants in a safe environment, and you can spray with some of your chemicals and see if they have a positive effect and, and prevent, actually, the, the uh, confer resistance and prevent the, the infection to happen. And if, you have, uh, if you're lucky, you still have chemicals left there from this pipeline. And if so, you can go to field trials. And uh, this is done through collaboration, at least in my case, uh, with academics, other academics, or, or government agencies. And once you're there, um, as an academic, there's not much you can do anymore. Uh, there's not enough money to bring the product to market. So you really need to uh, team up with a, one of the agrochemical multinational, the Syngenta, and so on of the world. Um, and they have the, um, they have the cash to uh, bring that to, uh, to fruition. And, and uh, Lot of these steps involved here uh, cost, I was told, around $200 million. These would involve making new field trials uh, several years, uh, several uh, continents to make sure that uh, different, um, different climate zone, uh, the chemical respond well in different climate zone and so on, different crops to see the, uh, the, the breadth of the, the that can be conferred, the breadth of the resistance that can be conferred and so on. In these steps, there would be some toxicology uh, tests. Are these chemicals going to kill you? Are they going to kill uh, the fish or the amphibian, uh, the frogs in, in the water? Do they linger in the soil? Do they leach out? Do they degrade rapidly and so on? So these are all the, the regulatory um, tests that need to be done before a chemical can go uh, on the market. And again, quite expensive and uh, cannot be done uh, as an academic. I haven't reached that kind of wealth yet to pay for that myself. And so um, again, the, uh, or mentioned that these, these multinational today, they're quite involved in making uh, fungicides. Um, and they're not so much interested in doing the research to bring new types of uh, of mode of action that would not be uh, trying, mode of action that would not attempt to kill pathogen. And um, so the idea for us, for an academic, is really to decrease the risk for them and, and get them interested in some new chemicals that are designed to boost the plant uh, def own defense as opposed to go and, and kill pathogen. And if we can get to the field trial and, and entice them, uh, they will be uh, willing, I guess, to, to move and, and further test these chemicals and see the, their efficacy in, in the field. And it, essentially, we're uh, trying to de-risk the, the process for them. And at the same time, the goal is to push for um, new ways of crop protection in the field, 
ways that we think may be um, potentially uh, less harmful for the environment. And I think I spent more time than I should have. Uh, again, our strategy uh, is to uh, develop molecules that stimulate the plant immunity, just like the salicylic acid does naturally inside the plant, as opposed to uh, developing molecules like fungicides that kill fungus. Some of these molecules will be, of course, synthetic in nature and would be only suitable for conventional agriculture, but some of them could be natural products and therefore they could be suitable for the organic agriculture as well. And on this, I thank you and ready for questions.